Hey, we're going to do this video trying to cover some of the key content in Chapter 1 on the models of democracy and some of the underlying principles of how democracy works. Um, and the information, most of it is covered in your book, but the goal of this video is to replace some of the content in Chapter 1 so that you don't have to read it. Please feel free to pause the video as needed so that you can take notes along the way. So in the book, one of the things that they talk about is Robert Dahl's traditional democratic theory. What you're going to notice when we talk about Robert Dahl is that he's kind of an idealist. But he talks about the fact that democracies, in order to be fully functioning, they need to have equality in voting, meaning everybody needs to be able to participate but when he, uh, and, and vote. But he is not talking about like everybody voting as in like five-year-olds voting. But he is talking about all adults need to have the same access to being able to legally participate in voting. He talks about the fact that you need to have effective participation, meaning that people in society need to be able to express their viewpoints and need to be given avenues to be able to do that and also have enough free time in their life in order to be able to do that. He talks about the need for enlightened understanding, that the electorate, in order to be um, really good decision makers about like what type of public policies they want to support, what type of leaders they want to support, they need to understand the issues and they need to have appropriate background in order to be able to understand the issues and have appropriate access to information in order to understand the issues. He also talks about the fact that there needs to be citizen control of the agenda, meaning that in a democracy, the government, because they're supposed to be working for the people, should be listening to the citizens about what should their top priorities be, i.e. that the people should be able to give some sort of input to their government says, hey, we think it's really important for you to work on, work on X issue, but not as important for you to work on Y issue, and then the government would respond in, in kind. Lastly, that there needs to be inclusion, that you need to be able to have our society, if it's a real democracy, include people, and that would include people with disabilities, people of different class levels, people of different economic levels, people who are immigrants, but the idea that there wouldn't be power dynamics between different groups of people where they're using those power dynamics to keep political power from other groups. He's very much a proponent that you know, you're going to have whoever votes and gets the majority win, but that you need to also have minority rights, and that a key part of having a fundamental democracy is that those minority rights need to be respected. Now, Edwards, who's your textbook author, argues that there are some challenges to Dahl's argument about what, democrat, what democracies need in order to function. He argues that in our present day, we have four limits. One, he's concerned about the increasing technology expertise that we have, or as some people call the digital divide. And that affects, obviously, this idea of enlightened understanding. If not everybody has access to the Internet, if nobody, not everybody has access to news sources, then we're really not going to have that same level of enlightened understanding, and that's going to be... Um, discriminatory to people. Second, he talks about this idea that we have limited participation in government, that generally speaking, poorer people work more jobs and more hours and are less politically active, and people who are wealthier and more educated have more time for politics and feel a greater sense of political efficacy and agency and are more involved. And he's concerned about that um, division in our society. Third of all, he's concerned about the increased campaign costs, right? And that affects people's citizen participation for sure, that not everybody feels like they can participate because you need so much money to even get in the door. And the idea is that we're supposed to have a citizen legislature, but yet it, is it really representative of your average American? And if you look at it, no, Edwards isn't wrong. Disproportionately, the people that serve us in Congress are white, they're men, they're highly educated, they're wealthy, and that's not what America looks like. And so that's one of Edwards' concerns. And then lastly... Edwards uses the terms that he's worried about diverse political interests, but I would say that since your textbook was written, he might even go as far as to say the increasing polarization that we have in the United States, that we really have very little space for common ground and for people to make compromises and talk to each other, particularly in a civil way, in this increasingly polarized world of being super liberal and super conservative or super radical and super reactionary 
And so um, those are some of his concerns about um, democracy in this current period. Wilson, who writes a different American government textbook, he um, talks about democratic theory and has these key arguments. He says that citizens must have control over their leaders through elections. C civilian control over the military is, is a complete prerequisite. You need to have um, the military not be running the show. The military must work for the democratically elected government. Um, that you need to have rulers not having complete control of the economy, and this would be an example of how democracy and capitalism you know, normally work hand in glove with each other. Um, citizens must agree to have their conflicts resolved by the political rules of the government, i.e. that people aren't out being vigilantes going Batman on each other. Um, in majoritarian politics, which is the fancy pants word for whoever wins most votes wins, Office holders are, are t tightly held to their constituent viewpoints, that they're actually supposed to mirror or match our viewpoints as society. Wilson, like Edwards, also sort of points out what are some of the things that he doesn't think match between our current society and what democratic theory says that our democracy is supposed to be doing. His concern is, is that we frequently do not send very clear messages to the government. We send messages that say, oh, 50% of us want this, 49% of us want that. And then what it means is that people in power basically get to default to their own decision making because we aren't sending them any clear messages, and so they get to make the decisions that they want. And that's one of the concerns that he raises. The College Board has identified that one of the things that's important for us to cover in this unit is to look at the fact that, okay, the United States has chosen a representative democracy, we have a republic, we vote for people who then make decisions for us, but the fact is, is that political scientists use different lenses, or I like to think of different pairs of glasses, to look at, the, to look at our democracy. So I'm basically blind, and so when I wear my glasses, woo, I can see all sorts of things. But if, but if you were to wear my glasses, you wouldn't see the same things that I would see. But the idea is that, like, what pair of glasses you wear are making certain things um, come in more clearly and other things less clearly. And so depending upon which sort of lens you're wearing as a political scientist, you are looking at our current events, our government, with sort of a different idea of what, de what democracy it looks like or how it functions, okay? And so we're going to talk about these four types of representative democracy. The first type is called participatory democracy. And a matter of fact, it is not covered in your book super directly. But the idea with participatory democracy is, is that people vote directly for their laws instead of giving this responsibility to others, like to Congress, we would vote on our own laws. And we occasionally get to do this, not at the federal level, but at the state level or the local level. So for example, most of the time when we decide whether or not we're going to build a stadium, politicians are like, oh, I don't want to raise taxes on my watch, so I'm going to kick that question to the state from the state legislature to you, the citizens, and then you guys get to vote on when we're gonna, whether or not we're going to build a new stadium for the Vikings. Um, but so 26 states in the United States have ballot measures. So either through initiatives or referendums, initiatives come from the people, referendums come from the government, but the idea is that a question is put on the ballot. Should we do X? Should Y become legal? And then whoever gets the most votes, boom, that's added to the state constitution. That's creating a law. There are other ways to do participatory democracy. So a couple years ago, um, under the Obama administration, we had a movement, it was called the Occupy Wall Street movement that was sweeping the country. And so locally here in Minneapolis, what people did is they took over Hennepin County Government Center in downtown Minneapolis, and they lived there in this cooperative community where they like shared cooking responsibilities, they shared cleaning responsibilities. They had an assembly every night. Everybody who was at that assembly got to vote, and they made decisions about how they were going to organize themselves, what issues they were going to work on, what protest theme topic they were going to have the next day. And that would be an example of participatory democracy. 
Lastly, um, in New England, they have a town hall meeting tradition that really comes from or out of the spirit of ancient Gre Greece. But the idea is that you would have, you would call for a town hall meeting. Anybody in town would come to the meeting. You would have a debate. Everybody who is there got a vote. And if you couldn't come to the meeting, you didn't get a say. Robert Dahl is also um, one of the political scientists who talks about pluralist democracy. Pluralist democracy is a very optimistic view of democracy, which makes sense if you think about how we've already talked about Robert Dahl. And he argues that because of open access to various institutions of government and public officials, that we, the people, have the ability to organize ourselves into groups, like interest groups, like the NAACP, like the ACLU, like PETA, the People for Ethical Treatment of Animals, like um, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, and that these groups that we can organize ourselves into have the ability to fight with each other over policy, but a pluralist feels like that's a fair fight. That basically we have this marketplace of ideas and whoever's ideas are the best is going to persuade the most people and then that idea that is voted on that is won over by the government totally represents what we the people want. And so um, that is the pluralist democracy viewpoint in terms of like analyzing how the U.S. is functioning. Now the hyper-pluralist point of view is you know, runs with that pluralist point of view, but it's really a critique of pluralism. They see that the U.S. has all these different competing groups, but that each of these groups is so strong that they are actually, that the government is weakened, that it is, you know, so strangled by this polarization that we're having in this government that we end up having gridlock and that the government can't take action or takes actions that are contradictory, thereby making that no clear policy actually happens. They see the United States as having too many organizations and too many ways of influencing the government and don't think that the U.S. government is functioning. So a pluralist thinks that the U.S. is functioning very healthily and thinks our democracy is working well, whereas a hyper-pluralist thinks that our government is not working and um, has, a, has a different interpretation. People who believe in elite democracy, and you've got here, you know, my Simpsons example, basically believe that the elite, and when they talk about the elite, they're talking about the wealthy, the educated, the ruling class, that these people make decisions for the rest of us, and frequently they make these decisions in their own best interests. And so when people are using the elite democracy point of view, their concern is that it's kind of like the Lakers roughing their own game. If the Lakers are roughing their own game, you know what? It's going to be hard for the Timberwolves to score. And so the idea is that if, you, if we have an elite democracy and the elite is actually running the government, then the government is going to make decisions in their, that are in the best interest of the elite and not in the best interest of ordinary people. And so the, the reason why I have the 1% cartoon is um, an elite democracy theorist would say that our democracy is being run for and by the 1% and that the 99% are not really getting served. Um, different elite theorists sort of have different commentaries on the degree to which we understand that the government is being not run in our, in, you know, in our favor. But the idea is, is that we don't have access to our government officials in any real meaningful way and that they don't have incentives in order to listen to us. Okay, so how is this useful? In APUS government, we have a set of foundational documents. Okay, and you are going to be asked to on tests and on the by the College Board and the AP exam to analyze these foundational documents using these points of view, looking at things like Federalist Papers ten and saying, okay, you know, is Hamilton you know, writing this from a pluralist, a hyper-pluralist, elite democracy or participatory democracy point of view? And what evidence do you have of that point of view in this document? And so we're going to practice that in this unit, but we're going to practice that the next two trimesters. Um, what we're going to do today and in class is apply these ideas to current events as a way to practice this. So let's take a look at this next scenario. Tuan, Jamal, Marie, and Signe are having a conversation. 
press pause and take a look at their conversation and label in your head or on your own sheet of paper which point of view you think is being represented by which speaker. And remember, your choices are participatory democracy, pluralism, hyperpluralism, and elite democracy. Okay, so if you take a look at Tuan's quote, hopefully you labeled that Tuan is, an, is giving an example of pluralist democracy, where he says everyone gets a vote, the minority viewpoint should, um, you know, has equal access to being able to participate, they just didn't win. You know, those are some of your clues that it's, that it's pluralism. If you look at Jamal, Jamal is definitely a hyper-pluralist, where he says that the government is overwhelmed with contradictory viewpoints, and he talks about the government as being broken. You know, so Tuan's got that positive view. Jamal's got that view that it's broken. Tuan sees that there are, like, lots of different groups and ideas being thrown out there, and that that makes the process better. Jamal thinks that everybody sort of throwing into the conversation makes it not function. Okay? So that's how you see that's pluralist versus hyperpluralist. If you take a look at Marie, Marie is representing an elite democracy point of view, right? Because she's talking about the fact that these politicians are not serving our interests, that they're tricking us, that they're really serving other interests, their own interests. And then lastly, if you look at Signe, Signe is an example of someone who believes in participatory democracy. She's choosing to be involved at a workplace where she gets to have a vote and she doesn't have a boss, and that the workers are the boss, and that's an example of this idea of participatory democracy. If you think about the United States policymaking system, Depending upon which pair of glasses you're wearing, which sort of framework you're, you're using as a political scientist, you're going to look at this policymaking system differently. So I, everyone thinks that people have interests, concerns, problems, but your, your viewpoint about how they affect linkage institutions and which linkage institutions, what type of impact they get to have on the process depends on which of these viewpoints you have. So linkage institutions are the way that the people get to influence or communicate with the government. And they include political parties, elections, the media, and interest groups. So, for example, pluralists think that the interest groups are a really functional part of the policymaking process, right? Whereas hyperpluralists think, heck no, they, they're, you know, they're corrupting our system. If you're an elite democracy theorist, you think that these, um, these link linkage institutions are basically there as window dressing to like give people the illusion of democratic input. But then, a matter of fact, the political parties that are, you know, are, are you know, and, and the people that are running the political parties are running it in the interest of the 1%, not in the interest of your average Joe, Jane, Juan, Juana. The policy agenda is the issues that attract the serious attention of public officials and the people involved in politics. And again, depending upon your political viewpoint about how democracy functions, you think different groups of people get to influence that, that policy agenda. Right? If you believe in participatory democracy, you think the people get to pick that policy agenda. If you believe in um, pluralism, you think that the interest group that wins right, in this fair fight between different interest groups, they get to set that policy agenda. You know, If you're a, an elite um, democracy theorist, you believe that the elite are the ones setting that policy agenda. So that's important to understand. We're going to in a second talk about policymaking institutions and, you know, so then the government is influenced and they actually make this, you know, they make policy. And policy, when we talk about public policy, it's a choice that the government makes in response to a political issue. So they choose to raise taxes or they choose to lower taxes. They choose to increase environmental regulations or they choose to lower environmental regulation. And then lastly, you have that this affects the people, this, inf this influence of policies. So what we're going to do over the next two trimesters is, is talk about the public policy system, the policy making system. But when we're talking about these different interpretations of democracy, it's important to understand that everybody agrees that this is how public policy is made. The difference is sort of like, depending upon what pair of glasses you're wearing, you sort of see different aspects of it brighter than others, or you see certain aspects of it more vivid than others. 
In terms of when we talk about public policy, and remember, public policy is a choice that a government makes in response to a political issue. Um, we're going to be talking the next two trimesters about the fact that the government has a lot of different ways that can actually take political action, right? It can make a congressional law or statute. It can have a presidential action, like it could be an executive order or an executive agreement. The court can actually also make policy. Um, Congress can make policy by choosing to fund something or not fund something. And then also parts of the government bureaucracy, like um, governmental agencies, like the Environmental Protection Agency, for example, can make regulations or withdraw regulations. And all of those are examples of how public policy is made. So this is an example of a dialogue I wrote two years ago um, when there were a lot of people protesting in North Dakota over the expansion of the pipeline. What I'd like you to do is to read through this, this discussion between Jose, Angela, and Derek, and I'd like you to label which you think um, represents what they're saying. And remember, your choices are participatory democracy, pluralism, hyperpluralism, or elite democracy. And we will start with this when you come back to class. Thank you very much.